All right, why don't we get started? So good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to another exciting edition of CAPER. Uh, we have some great presentations today. My name is Mohammed Khan. I am uh, an interventional endoscopist at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, uh, just started this week, uh, accompanied by my co-moderator, uh, Dr. David Vitale, uh, over at far away at the University of Cincinnati uh, with Cincinnati Children's Medical Center. Uh, so great to have a good friend here uh, moderating this exciting sessions on the endoscopic management of uh, pancreatitis. So we have some great speakers um, and we'll get into that in just a second. Uh, hope everyone enjoyed last week's sessions on medical management of pancreatitis. Uh, for everyone in the audience, uh, thanks for joining. Um, we're going to hope to keep things on time. We've got about uh, 20 minutes per session. We'll have some time for uh, uh, questions that you guys ask in the chat. So we will review those and ask them at the end of each talk. Um, and if you keep your lines muted, that'd be awesome. So just to introduce uh, Dr. Guru Trikudanathan, uh, who is at the University of Minnesota. He is an associate professor up there and an interventional endoscopist. Um, and he's gonna be presenting today on the endoscopic management of acute and necrotizing pancreatitis. All right, thank you, Mohammed. Let me start sharing my screen. Uh, see, see them well? Yes, you're looking good. You hear me well too? Indeed. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Guru Trikudanathan. I'm one of the associate professor at University of Minnesota. And uh, uh, I'm also a therapeutic endoscopist uh, with clinical and research interest in necrotizing pancreatitis. I would like to thank Caper Academy for this wonderful opportunity for me to present on this topic, endoscopic management of necrotizing pancreatitis. The following are my disclosures. Uh, in the next 20 minutes, I would like to review the terminology, discuss some of the clinical outcomes of endoscopic step-up approach. Also touch a little bit about the current controversies and endoscopic step-up approach and uh, discuss a few uh, tips for how to refine and optimize outcomes for endoscopic necroscopy and finally touch a little bit on the complications we face during endoscopic necrosectomy. Um, to begin with, uh, just to refresh everybody's memory, this is the revised Atlanta classification. Uh, this is the classification we use to classify acute, uh, or sorry, peripancreatic uh, fluid or necrotic collections. Based on this classification, there are four types of collections and collections which are less than four weeks are known as uh, acute, or it could be either acute peripancreatic fluid collection or acute necrotic collection, with fluid collection obviously having liquid contents and acute necrotic collection having solid contents which may have intrapancreatic or extrapancreatic extent. Uh, when it comes to greater than four weeks, there are two types of collections, which uh, one of them is called a pseudo pancreatic pseudocyst, and, uh, which is essentially extra pancreatic and completely uh, uh, filled with fluid uh, with minimal solids. And then we have walled off necrosis, which could be intrapancreatic or extra pancreatic with a well defined wall. And it's very important to know the, these definitions because the management of and uh, necrotizing pancreatitis revolves around these definitions. For example, if a patient develops an acute fluid or necrotic collection and is about to be intervened, uh, there has an indication to be intervened, we delay, we postpone, we wait for those collections to become walled off or encapsulated. And if a patient has a pseudocyst, these patients we could get away with just drainage but whereas if a patient has a walled off necrosis, we do need to debride. We need to drain the collection and then go and do endoscopic or percutaneous or uh, bad related debriding. And as far as indications for interventions are concerned, infection is the main uh, indication. Uh, when it comes to sterile collections, if a patient has gastric outlet obstruction or biliary tract obstruction, 
or has persistent unwellness uh, and uh, or failure to thrive, these are all indications for intervention. And also to define endoscopic, uh, also we need to uh, touch upon a couple of terminologies as far as uh, endoscopic management is concerned. One is endoscopic transluminal drainage. By endoscopic transluminal main drainage, we essentially refer to EUS or endoscopy guided cyst entrostomy and placement of cyst entrostomy stents across the, cystos across the cystostomy or cyst entrostomy tracts. Uh, this is usually followed by endoscopic transluminal necrosectomy if there are solid contents. Here we go in with directly into the cavity with, an, uh, with a scope, uh, with an upper endoscope, and we use a variety of accessories like, uh, like uh, nets or baskets or usually snares, and we could also use chemical debriding agents like hydrogen peroxide, or we have some new kids in the block like powered uh, endoscopic debridement technique. And we keep repeating this until we have a clinical and imaging resolution of the necrotic collection. Um, when it comes to the clinical outcomes, there are several studies out there, but uh, there are three essential randomized control trial, uh, which everybody should be familiar with. Two of them were conducted by the Dutch pancreatitis group, the penguin study and the tension study. And the MISA trial was conducted by uh, the Florida hospital group uh, by Shyam Bharadrajulu and others. Uh, essentially, all these three studies have a conclude that there is no difference in mortality between the endoscopic step-up approach as compared to the open necrosectomy. However, the, uh, the new onset organ failure is significantly lower in the endoscopic arm, as well as complications such as fistula are, uh, in, uh, are lower in endoscopic step-up arm. And the MISA study went a step ahead and they looked at quality of life at three months follow-up. And the physical component of the quality of life was found to be significantly uh, better with the endoscopic step-up approach as compared to open necrosectomy. And also when we look at the overall cost and the hospital cost, the endoscopic step-up approach is far superior to the open necrosectomy. So to summarize the clinical outcomes, Endoscopic step-up approach is associated with reduced physiological stress. There is reduced occurrence of new onset multi-organ failure. These patients end up staying in the hospital for fewer days. There is overall reduced cost. There is significantly reduced fistulae and complications like fistulae with no significant difference in mortality. So there is, it's essentially a no-brainer. Uh, if a patient needs intervention and and it's endoscopically amenable, endoscopic step-up approach should be the first line of uh, treatment. So the first controversy I want to address is when do we drain these collections? And the typical, the, the standard guidelines recommend us to wait as long as possible. And we wait for four weeks, but although I would say the four weeks is an arbitrary cutoff, which came from the surgical literature with the new uh, with the advent of this new lumen opposing metal stents, this four weeks cutoff is, can be really questioned. Uh, and we uh, at University of Minnesota looked at this. Uh, uh, we compared the patients who underwent early endoscopic step up approach and compared them with patients who underwent the standard greater than four weeks endoscopic step up approach. And uh, uh, the, the, the patients we chose for the early endoscopic approach were all these infected necrosis uh, who have um, uh, who are critically ill with multi-organ failure most often in the ICU and um, they all had multi-organ failure and the, when it comes to the outcome we identified that endoscopic approach was associated with significant improvement in organ failure. And this was more pronounced in the early endoscopic arm as compared to the standard arm. And if you look at it, most of the patients did not require dialysis after a week, or they were weaned off ventilation after a week, or weaned off pressors after a week. So the overall outcome, it was not surprising that the mortality was significantly higher in patients undergoing early endoscopic approach. Remember, these are critically ill patients the, and they all have infected necrosis, multi-organ failure, most of them in the ICU. The mortality in those patients is 30 to 40%. 
In our study, it was around 13%, but it was still significantly higher than 4% in the standard endoscopic approach arm. And but what is to be noted or highlighted is the risk of complications did not differ. In fact, the perforation was higher in the standard arm as opposed, as opposed to the early endoscopic SEPAP approach. And this, these retros, this was a retrospective study. This was, this was again, um, uh, these findings were validated by a Mayo Clinic study, by an Indian study at PGI. And the Dutch pancreatitis group then came up with a multi-centered randomized control trial. This was published in NEJM last year. This is what we know, what we call as a pointer study, where they compared immediate versus post postponed intervention for infected necrosis. And their definition for immediate was catheter drainage less than five weeks, uh, sorry, at five, five weeks, uh, and postponed drainage was greater than uh, five weeks. And uh, what they concluded was the risk of complications, uh, sorry, the risk of uh, complications did not differ. However, uh, patients who were uh, in randomized to the intermediate catheter drainage group ended up needing more endoscopic interventions. And uh, uh, whereas the patients in the postponed catheter group, nearly one third of the patients, were, we have, they were able to avoid interventions. Uh, in other words, they did not find any benefit in draining patients before five weeks. So this was a pointer study, and but there are a few significant differences which needs to be highlighted. The pointer study, the median time to intervene was 24 days. Whereas at our center, the median time to intervene was 20 days. So they, are, they were essentially looking at three and a half weeks. So not surprisingly, majority of their collections were well encapsulated, at least in 60%, as opposed to only 42% encapsulation in our, our cohort. And uh, these patients, only really less than a quarter of the patients had organ failure, whereas nearly 43% had multi-organ failure in our cohort. And the endoscopic approach they used uh, involved a placement of two seven French double pigtail stents and nasocystic drain. Ours was more the contemporary practice. We had patients getting lamps, metal stents, and 10 French stents. Again, we, we will see what the difference in stents could lead to. Um, and also, a, a, a percentage of patients underwent uh, percutaneous drainage and they upsized them to 22. So we are literally, we are not, we are comparing apples to oranges. And so the final verdict is, um, is there a role for early endoscopic step-up approach? We believe so uh, in critically ill patients with infected necrosis and multi-organ failure who are completely refractory to medical management. This could be performed in tertiary care center with advanced backup and advanced expertise. However, our conclusion needs to be validated in more multi-center prospective studies. Again, we do not recommend this in the community practice, but in tertiary care centers with advanced uh, backup and expertise, it's something which could be embarked on. The second controversy I want to address is the choice of stents, uh, plastic stents, the double pigtail versus the more glamorous lumen opposing metal stents, which has been in a practice uh, for about five to six years now. Uh, there's a single, there was a one randomized control trial, again, by the Varadarajalu group uh, from Florida Hospital. They really did not uh, identify any superiority over uh, of the lumen opposing stents over the plastic stents, except for the procedure duration. And there was no significant difference in the total number of procedure, treatment success, adverse events, readmissions, length of stay, and overall cost. So they, they determined that a choice of stent should be based on a clinical status. If a patient is critically ill, the LAMPS is preferred because the procedure duration was 15 minutes uh, as opposed to 40 minutes with the plastic stents. And if a patient has disconnected pancreatic duct, more to it when we discuss the complications, uh, we would prefer the plastic stents. If a patient is poorly compliant, again, plastic stents are preferred. Again, all this should be determined by a multidisciplinary consensus and financial consideration should be borne in mind as well. Uh, again, the Dutch pancreatitis group came up with the axioma study. They compared their LAMPS experience with the plastic stents used in some of their prospective studies like tension study. 
And they essentially concluded that lamps do not reduce the need for necrosectomy as compared to plastic stents and complication rates, including risk of bleeding were comparable between the two groups. And again, no difference in the healthcare cost. Um, so the next question is, do we, leave, do we place these lamps and do we, is that the panacea, are we done? Uh, and from our experience, placement of the lamps is probably the most straightforward uh, uh, procedure. Uh, the, what, hap what follows is what, uh, what is a big deal in management of necrotizing pancreatitis. And uh, uh, typically patients need necrosectomy and step up approach if they have collections greater than, uh, if they, sorry, if their solid content is greater than 30%. If they have deep retroperitoneal or paracolic extension, or if the size of the collection is greater than 10 centimeters, this was vividly shown in a, a Mayo Clinic retrospective study. And uh, then the next question is like, how do we refine necrosectomy? Because necrosectomy, as uh, everybody who has been doing it, is uh, would know and would agree, it's a labor-intensive procedure. It goes on for hours, and uh, usually it's saved for the junior or mid-career faculty members. And um, uh, there are a few ways of making this get better, or doing this better. Sometimes we could access using cyst gastrostomy, cyst entrostomy, or put multiple cyst entrostomy, uh, cyst gastrostomy stents. That's one way uh, we could use for collections which involve the deep retroperitoneum or what we call as a paracolic gutter, percutaneous drainage and sinus tract endoscopy is an op option, especially if, and for that sinus tract endoscopy, the, the drain should be a retroperitoneal drain. And the other things we can do is using hydrogen peroxide. Again, at University of Minnesota, we do not use this routinely, but there is a role in probably one third of the patients. And other centers have tried other agents like uh, streptokinase, and they've shown that streptokinase is actually uh, slightly uh, re re resulted in reduced risk of necrosectomy and mortality, but there, were, and there was more bleeding with hydrogen peroxide. So the question out there is, is hydrogen peroxide a problematic solution or solution to a problem? There's a lot of bubbling which happens after hydrogen peroxide. So, you know, uh, we could use it when we need to. And then there is this new endorotor system. This was essentially used for polypectomies, but this has been extrapolated uh, in necrosectomy world as well. And that has been shown to reduce the number of sessions and also decrease the length of stay. And then the Vanderbilt group has come up with this water jet necrosectomy device. It's still not validated in human beings and that appears promising as well. So typically at University of Minnesota, if we come across an infected necrotic collection like this, this is one of the patients we recently treated, a 35 year old who was airlifted with infected necrosis with multi-organ failure. And you can see all this gas bubble and the, a, the, a collection like a horseshoe shaped collection of extending to the left paracolic gutter. And these patients, we do multi, multi gateway technique. In other words, this patient needed a cyst gastrostomy, a cyst deodinostomy here. And then we ended up placing a couple of retroperitoneal 24 French drain. And the most important thing is nutrition. So, enteral nutrition is preferred. So, we placed a nasogeginal tube. This patient also had a uh, jaundice on presentation, so needed like uh, from a biliary stricture, so needed a 10 French uh, uh, biliary stent as well. And then uh, we did endoscopic necrosectomy. The collection did not get better. So then we ended up doing sinus tract endoscopy. Again, not much, we were not able to get make much progress. So then we did uh, something, uh, pretty novel and we have been doing this for these large retroperitoneal collections. We call this the rendezvous transgastric uh, or a per, a per oral and percutaneous endoscopy or necrosectomy. Here, as you see, there are two scope channels. Uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Freeman, has been getting the collection, advancing the scope from the retroperitoneum, from doing the sinus tract endoscopy. And he's pushing the necrotic material and I'm having the scope in the peroral route and I'm debriding whatever he is collecting. And it, it, it's funny, the, the scopes often kiss each other. And uh, we, we were able to get a lot of necrotic material. Uh, uh, after this, uh, we, uh, we were able to 
as I, as you see, obtain large chunks of necrotic material. After this, we were able to reposition the, the percutaneous drain. And again, this involves use of two advanced endoscopist time, but this is valuable in large, deep retroperitoneal collections, which are not amenable just for the straightforward necrosectomies. Um, so to summarize, the choice of stents is determined uh, by the size of the collection with plastic stents preferred for small sized collections and liquefied collections. And patients who are poorly compliant or uh, who are not likely to follow up in relatively stable patients. Whereas the LAMPS is preferred in critically ill patients because of shorter procedural duration and patients who have solid necrotic contents and uh, large size collections and who are rather compliant to follow up. And if the collection is not getting better with drainage alone, we go to necrosectomy. And if still there is no clinical and imaging improvement, then we use the hydrogen peroxide or this powered endoscopic debridement or some centers use a nasocystic drain. We also evaluate patients for retroperitoneal percutaneous drainage and sinus tract endoscopy. And then after this collection is resolved, we remove the lamps as soon as possible. We assess these patients for disconnected pancreatic duct, which we'll talk in a second. If patients do not have disconnected pancreatic duct. We remove these stents. If they do, we replace these lamps with plastic stents, which remains indefinitely. So I... I think I do have a couple of minutes to talk about complications. Um, the endoscopic step-up approach was associated with 36% complications in an earlier systematic review and with uh, about 6% procedure-related mortality. Again, this is earlier systematic review. Uh, the most important complication is uh, stent occlusion and infected necrosis. Uh, this is the classic um, lamps occlusion. After patients do well for five days, uh, their lamp stent gets occluded. And uh, bleeding is also not an uncommon complication. Um, bleeding can occur when we try in, uh, dilating the cystentrostomy tract. Uh, it could occur during necrosectomy. We have sometimes placed clips. Sometimes we need uh, like uh, lumen opposings or like a fully covered stent to oppose the cystentrostomy tract. Sometimes the bleeding can be controlled only with IR-guided embolization. Pseudoaneurysms can happen. Um, it's, as it's, it's been shown in some studies to be associated more with lamps. As you can see, the lamps is associated with rapid drainage of the necrotic collection. And once the cavity collapses, the vasculature gets exposed uh, to the distal flange and the inflammatory milieu. And that results in pseudoaneurysm, as you see and we ended up coiling. So it's very close and proxy, uh, it's in proximity of the lumen opposing metal stents. That's why we recommend removing them as soon as possible. We did a study which was published in GIE recently, and there the choice of the transmural stent did not determine the incidence of, uh, of pseudoaneurysm. We studied around 39 pa uh, patients. Splenic artery pseudoaneurysm was the most common uh, site. And, uh, but what was significant was Patients who underwent endoscopic drainage with lumen opposing metal stents were found to have an earlier incidence of pseudoaneurysm. This is not surprising. Again, lumen opposing metal stent drains these collections pretty quickly. So they were found to have a little bit of an earlier incidence as opposed to the patients managed with plastic stents. Perforation can occur during uh, endoscopic drainage of non adherent collections. It could also occur uh, from necrosectomy. And Often we, it needs open necrosis or open surgery to, to fix perforation, but we could start with transperitoneal drains, but uh, these patients should be managed in ICU. Fistula can happen, especially in the deep retroperitoneal collections. Uh, we can endoscopically place uh, Vesco clips to fix fistulas like the colonic fistula you're seeing here. And the last complication I want to touch upon is disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome. Uh, this is seen more uh, with the lumen opposing metal stents. We are seeing disconnected pancreatic duct syndrome. It manifests as pancreatocutaneous fistula or recurrent pseudocyst of fluid collection. Uh, but very often we see patients developing pancreatitis, uh, uh, acute recurrent pancreatitis or chronic pancreatitis of this upstream portion of the pancreas. Leaving transmural stents can prevent the pseudocyst. 
Uh, sometimes patients need more advanced endoscopic treatment. Uh, here, this is a classic example of a disconnected pancreatic duct with a, uh, a dilated tail duct. And uh, we have, uh, uh, we did an, what we call as an endoscopic pancreatogastrostomy by advancing wire into the upstream tail and then dilating with one of the angioplasty balloons and leaving three French stents. And then we left two, three French stents. And then these patients uh, eventually, once the pancreatogastrostomy tract is getting better, uh, these patients do very well. But most of these patients end up needing what we call as distal pancreatectomy. And uh, we have an islet lab, and we are fortunate to do auto islet transplant, sorry, islet auto transplantation in these patients. We harvest the islet cells from the tail of the pancreas and infuse them into the portal vein. And this uh, reduces the risk of diabetes uh, or reduces the insulin requirements, or rather gives a soft landing as far as post pancreatitis uh, diabetes is concerned. To summarize, um, uh, where does endoscopic drainage or necrosectomy stand? We start off uh, in any necrotizing pancreatitis with maximal supportive uh, management in terms of we, we do give them uh, a diet uh, or nutrition is most important, enteral nutrition is most important. We try antibiotics, we manage them in the ICU with uh, close monitoring. And that if these collections are persistent and when intervention is indicated, this is the University of Minnesota algorithm. Uh, if a collection is perigastric or periduodenal without extend, deep extension, we could manage them completely with endoscopic drainage and necrosectomy. With deep extension, we do need percutaneous drainage. Again, uh, we, we need to do retroperitoneal drainage and then we could do sinus tract endoscopy or VAD. And if a patient does not have a collection which is close to the stomach or the duodenum, we do everything percutaneously of using VAD. And if everything fails, we do open necrosectomy. As you can see from this picture, it requires a village. It requires a team. This is all done multidiscipl in a multidisciplinary manner. And this is our team. Uh, we have this. These are all the advanced endoscopists. These are our surge, critical care surgeons and our IR. What is not shown in the picture is some of our... RN coordinators, PAs, and APPs who also do a significant, who also play a significant role in management of this condition. With this, I would like to thank uh, Kaper Academy for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much. Excellent talk, Guru. That was a really nice uh, summary and a nice review of. Uh of pancreatic fluid collections and endoscopic management. So I think we have time probably uh, here for one brief question. I don't see anything popped up in, in the chat. So uh, one question I had, uh, you know, could you walk us through a little bit uh, of your timeline? Because we all know as soon as you put aluminum posing metal stent in, uh, specifically for walled off necrosis, the, the, uh, the clock starts ticking, right? To, to need to get that out at some point. Uh, and um, what is your specific timeline typically when you put a, a stent in that you're not entirely sure is going to need a necrosectomy? When do you get your next imaging? Uh, what is your ideal timing of when you're going to take that stent out uh, if everything goes well for the patient? Uh, excellent question, David. So uh, I usually, uh, or at uh, University of Minnesota, we usually recommend this contrast enhanced CT uh, within seven to 10 days after the initial drainage. And then we kind of reevaluate the collection. Is the collection getting smaller? Does the collection have any solid contents? All uh, drained, uh, then it's time to place plastic stents, especially if this, there is disconnected pancreatic duct. Uh, and one thing to remember is if the collection is small, uh, if the cavity kind of rapidly collapses with the lamps placement and there won't be lumen or there won't be cavity left for us to place plastic stents. So I think the seven to 10 days is what we usually do. And then we start doing necrosectomies after seven days. And we keep debriding every two to three days until the until the, or every week, until the cavity is completely collapses and uh, we have clean, we see clinical and imaging resolution of necrosis. Sure. And typically, once you see that collapse, what, what is the earliest you'll remove that lumen opposing metal stent? Because I know there's a lot of different approaches to, to how soon you might want to take it out with how mature the cyst is. Yeah, I mean, I would wait at least for five to seven days. I have never gone before five days because, I mean, five days is usually good. And especially if a patient is well-nourished, uh, five days would be enough for the tract to form. 
Uh, but always uh, remember, like, if there is this connected pancreatic duct, um, we may not be able to place a plastic stent if we wait for too long. But five days is the earliest I've gone. Probably seven days is uh, uh, reasonable. But you need to remove those stents as early as possible. Uh, when the cavity collapses, that's when the problem starts. The, the you know the vessels and the back wall gets exposed to the uh, distal flange or the inflammatory milieu. And that's when you get pseudoaneurysms and other complications. Sure. Laura, sure. Laura I have a quick question. What, what's your approach with uh, transpapillary drainage uh, alongside? Do you, do you do that regularly alongside of this as well? Do you wait? Do you do it first? Uh, good question. So uh, the question you're asking is, when do I do transpapillary drainage? Uh, uh, if I have an intraparenchymal collection, in other words, there is a lot of normal intervening pancreas. Those are the patients I would manage with transpapillary drains or transpapillary stents. Uh, uh, for patients who have like, uh, you know, pancreatic or peripancreatic collection, those are the ma major ones we deal with. We, we initially, we have tried placing these uh, stents uh, in a transpapillary manner into the cavity. Uh, sometimes it could help with disconnected pancreatic duct improvement, but uh, we do not routinely do transpapillary stents, but patients who are managed exclusively by transpapillary stents are those with small intraparenchymal collections, and those uh, will have normal intervening pancreas, so we don't want to go through the pancreas to put uh, axios or plastic stents there. Thanks. Great. Thank you for a great talk and uh, uh, great answers to those questions there. Thank you so much. So uh, uh, first of all, thank you so much, the organizers, the CAPO organizers, for inviting me to moderate this session. It's really a privilege to, to be here. I was part of the sessions last year as well, and this is just a great opportunity to uh, uh, get together as a group and uh, and hear about what's what uh, is up and coming and uh, uh, in the pancreas world. So uh, it's my also my privilege to introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Sam Hahn from the Ohio State University. Uh, he is an assistant professor there, therapeutic endoscopist. He did his therapeutic and advanced endoscopy training at University of Colorado, and uh, he's going to be talking to us a little bit today about. Uh, endoscopic management of acute recurrent pancreatitis and chronic pancreatitis. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, David. Uh, CAPER has had a significant role in my career, so I'm grateful to be able to talk during this year's Pancreas Academy. Uh, but it's a pleasure to be able to talk about something I'm passionate about, namely pancreatic endotherapy. And I have no disclosures to report. And today we'll talk about endoscopic options for both acute recurrent pancreatitis and chronic pancreatitis. For acute recurrent pancreatitis, or ARP, we'll focus on the main topics, including diagnosing and treating biliary allergy, diagnosing obstructing lesions, and also the diagnosis and treatment of pancreas divism. And then for chronic pancreatitis, we'll focus on pancreatic duct structures, stones, and pseudocysts. So while no, by, by no means comprehensive, we'll definitely cover as much as we can. Um, in regards to evaluating for biliary etiology in patients with acute recurrent pancreatitis, um, whether that be gallstones or cholelithiasis or sludge in the bile duct or gallbladder, EUS is highly sensitive and specific for detecting cholelithiasis. So should we find cholelithiasis on the EUS, ERCP remains the standard of care to remove stones and sludge. And it goes without saying that for patients with gallstones, they should be considered for a cholecystectomy as well. And I'm going to play this video. And so this is a patient that we recently had with three episodes of acute recurrent pancreatitis. That was a gallbladder full of sludge. This is a common bile duct here. And you can see that it has sludge in it. And then now you see a stone, it's hyperchoic. It has shadowing as well. So we proceed with ERCP in this patient. Uh, this is the cholangiogram. And as we fill the proximal mid and kind of distal bile duct, you'll see a couple of filling defects here. Uh, which are suggestive of stones. So we're going to go ahead and perform a biliary sphincterotomy, and that just facilitates the opening of the bile duct, and we eventually got two kind of black pigmented stones out, and hopefully the patient will do better from a pancreatitis standpoint. And in terms of ampullary lesions, they are best identified using a side viewing duodenoscope. Uh, sometimes it can be well visualized using a EUS scope or a side viewing echo endoscope. 
And if a lesion is identified, we do typically recommend performing a biopsy on our index evaluation to determine the pathology of the lesion, whether it's an ampullary adenoma, ampullary adenocarcinoma, or carcinoid tumor. Um, and EOS can also help identify the level of invasion of the lesion and can also help determine whether there's any intraductal extension. And if the lesion doesn't invade the muscular propria, endoscopic papillectomy can also be considered as well. Uh, another lesion that can cause acute recurrent pancreatitis is a main duct IPMN. So EUS and ERCP are primarily for diagnostic purposes, as these are usually resected surgically. Um, and the high level of mucin produced by these cysts are about to lead to pancreatitis via an obstructive pathway. And I'm going to show you this video here um, of a patient who had about actually two episodes of acute pancreatitis and then on imaging had a dilated PD segmentally. So this is an endoscopic ultrasound. This is the PD. And then you can see that it gets segmentally dilated, very dilated here, kind of moving towards the neck region from the head. Um, so in this case, our surgical oncology colleagues asked us to get a biopsy as well. So we also proceeded with ERCP. Now, this one doesn't have the classic fish mouth papilla, but we did perform pancreatoscopy. And as you can see that the pancreatic duct is vastly dilated here. Um, and then the pancreatic duct kind of upstream is normal. And so this lesion was interesting in that there weren't any characteristic features of a typical main duct IPMN, including like papillary projections, fish egg projections, or any mucin content. Um, but just to make sure, we did proceed with uh, some endoscopic biopsies using a spy bite forceps. And this is the forceps, it's a miniature forceps that we can fit through our pancreatoscope. And the biopsies actually came back as IPMN. So this patient actually went on to surgery. It's done well since then. Uh, next, I want to talk about a controversial topic, which is the endoscopic management of acute recurrent pancreatitis in patients with pancreas divism. As many of you know, quite a lot of people have pancreas divism, but the majority never develop pancreatitis. And minor papilla endotherapy, which is well represented in the picture, consists of performing minor papilla syndrotomy placing a stent and or balloon dilation, with the theory being that opening up that really small opening of the minor papilla will allow for improved pancreatic secretion. Now, while minor papilla therapy is performed quite often in these patients, there really is limited data to support this practice. Um, there was a single randomized control trial performed 30 years ago, uh, during which 19 patients with pancreas divism and at least two episodes of pancreatitis were randomized to getting a stent or no stent. However, it is important to note that in these patients, pancreatic duct cannulation was performed with contrast injection into the pancreatic duct to confirm pancreas divism. And all patients were followed every four months for a minimum of a year, at which point the pancreatic duct stent was removed. And so the stenting arm had significantly fewer hospitalizations and episodes of pancreatitis during the follow-up. Uh, furthermore, a 50% symptom improvement was noted in 90% of the patients who received the stent, compared to 11.1% in the control arm. So based on this data, people have been performing uh, minor papilla endotherapy. And I just want to show that in the video. So this is a patient who had uh, acute recurrent pancreatitis and was found on MRCP to have pancreas divism. So we proceeded with ERCP. You can see here we use wire-guided cannulation. And we are able to, this is the pancreatogram on the right, uh, we are able to get the wire to the tail of the pancreatic the pancreatic duct. However, you can see that the minor papilla opening is so tight that the sphincter tone, and this is a jag tone, so one of the smaller sphincter tones, it doesn't fit. So we're trying to basically force a uh, balloon dilator. In. Eventually, the balloon dilator gets in, and we basically try to perform a balloon dilation of the minor papilla. But you're going to see that it's actually so tight that the balloon bursts, and so it starts leaking. Um, but that opened it up just enough so that we could finally fit our sphincter tome through. And then we performed a small uh, minor papillotomy or minor papilla sphincterotomy. At which point, um, there still was a lot of resistance. So we actually used the Sohendra stent retriever um, to dilate this tract and kind of the proximal head of the pancreatic duct here. And once we dilated that, we were able to fairly easily put a pancreatic duct stent. Um, this, so this patient had a stent for about a month and then we took it out and so far she's done well. Um, but what I really want to do is highlight an ongoing multi-center study funded by the NIH 
It's led by Drs. Greg Cote and Dira Giada. And the SHARP trial is a randomized sham control trial comparing minopapilla endotherapy with a sham control. And this is a really important study that will hopefully provide some major answers regarding whether we should be doing endotherapy in these patients. And if you have patients with pancreas tibism and acute recurrent pancreatitis, I would highly recommend referring the patients over for the study. Uh, moving on to chronic pancreatitis, we'll start with uh, pancreatic duct strictures, uh, which represent a common complication of disease. And current guidelines currently recommend um, endoscopic dilation and stent placement as first-line therapy for patients with strictures and associated pain. And in terms of technical considerations, European guidelines recommend placing a 10 French stent and exchanging it over the course of the year if symptoms improve after the index stent placement. And long-term studies have shown that there's been kind of long-term pain relief in about two-thirds of these patients. And dilation methods typically include a balloon dilator, which you saw in the, the prior minor papilla video. And there are some salvage maneuvers, which can include the use of a Sohendra stent retriever, which we also saw during the minor papilla video. You can use assistatome, and you can also use laser dissection as well, which we'll show later. Um, this is a video of someone with a pancreatic duct structure with chronic pancreatitis. You can see the very dilated upstream duct. And so I performed pancreatoscopy, and you can see just how tight that structure is. Um, the whole duct is inflamed, which is pretty classic when you have patients with severe chronic pancreatitis. And so we're going to try to balloon dilate this structure. And as you can see, there's a very, very tight waist, even though we're using a pretty big balloon. It's not really doing much. Um, and actually, you can see the stricture endoscopically, um, which is kind of hard to do typically. But so in this patient, we proceeded with uh, stem placement, actually with a seven French stent. And so we've been upsizing every three months, and she's kind of on her third round of stents now. Hopefully, we'll be able to take it out uh, with resolution of her stricture. And refractory strictures are defined as persistent strictures lasting greater than a year uh, with placement of a single 10 French stent. So these can be placed with placement of either multiple plastic stents or with a cover metal stent. And data regarding the use of cover metal stents, however, is still limited primarily to case series. And there are currently no FDA approved metal stents for use in the pancreatic duct. Um, recently, however, the use of fully cover metal stents has gained interest as a way to treat these strictures. And there was a meta-analysis involving 163 subjects that found a pretty high stricture resolution rate after using a metal stem with a low rate of recurrence if the stem was kept in longer than three months. And the largest US experience found similar results with corresponding pain relief as well. Unfortunately, again, as I mentioned, there's very limited data regarding this. And again, there's no FDA approved metal stent for this indication currently. Um, here, I'm just gonna illustrate kind of a way for salvage dilation in patients with refractory structure. So this patient had a refractory structure stenting for greater than a year. And this was even with putting about 20 French worth of stents in each time. So we actually used a thulium laser and we basically gently dissect away the structure. And we found pretty good success with this in terms of salvage therapy. Uh, next, to move on to pancreatic duct stones. So pancreatic duct stones can either be calcified stones or radiolucent protein plugs. They form in about 50% of patients with chronic pancreatitis. They're more frequent in men, heavy drinkers, and heavy smokers, and are frequently located in the head of the pancreas, with half of them being associated with pancreatic duct structures. And stone treatment is typically indicated when patients have pain in an attempt to decompress the duct and treat ductal hypertension. And pancreatic duct stones have typically been treated endoscopically via ERCP, during which a sphincterotomy is made and stones are removed with a balloon or basket. In Asia and Europe, however, extracorporeal shock lithotripsy, or ESWL, or SWL, is commonly performed. And European guidelines recommend its use in stones greater than 5 millimeters in diameter. SWL has a relatively high rate of complete stone clearance with a relatively low adverse event rate. And this is an example of SWAL with the left imaging showing an obstructing pancreatic duct stone that's about 10 millimeters in diameter in the head of the pancreas. And we administered about 3,000 shocks in this patient, uh, which resulted in complete fragmentation of the stone, stone as seen on the image on the right. And then pancreatoscopy guided lithotripsy is an ERCP enabled method, uh, which allows for direct visualization of stones. And there are two primary lithotripsy methods, electrohydraulic lithotripsy, or EHL, and laser lithotripsy, or LL. 
and retrospective studies have shown relatively high stone clearance rates. And I'm going to demonstrate some of several of the techniques with the following videos. Um, so this is the use of the EHL probe, which is the most common probe you'll see in the US. Um, but basically, you kind of create this uh, shockwave uh, kind of phenomenon within the duct, as long as you have an aqueous medium. And you can see the stone starting to fragment here in a patient with an impacted uh, stone. And next, I'm going to show you a video of uh, laser lithotripsy. Um, so this is a holmium laser. Nice thing about this is that you have a green kind of pointer, if you will, that shows you where the laser energy is going to be directed. Uh, and one of the advantages of laser lithotripsy is that you can use the fiber many times, even after a kind of phrase like this, you can just take the fiber out and cut it. And it basically works as good as new. And in general, I use laser for when uh, there are stones that are refractory to EHL. I do think it's better than EHL, although we have no studies to kind of suggest that in terms of randomized um, data. And then lastly, with the lithotripsy methods, I do want to highlight the spy basket, which is a pancreatoscopy specific retrieval basket. Uh, you can see here there's some stone fragments, and this is a pretty big basket. It actually opens up to 15 millimeters. Uh, so in the pancreatic duct, it's a little bit challenging to use because of the limited diameter of the pancreatic duct itself. But basically, you open it up, and you want to open it up past the stone, and then you kind of close the basket. And then you're able to basically grab the basket, and you can pull it out of the pancreatic duct. I do want to mention, however, that you want to be careful that you don't bring out too big of a stone because it could get stuck in the duct as well. But that's the stone once we take it out. Um, so in these two tables, we see the advantages and disadvantages of ESWL and pancreatoscopy guided lithotripsy. Um, ESWL is highly efficient and safe, but it's limited by the inability to identify radiolucent stones, inability to treat strictures, and limited availability availability in the US. Uh, furthermore, ESWL is not ideal for patients with extensive stone burden throughout the pancreatic duct, particularly the tail where collateral damage to the spleen can occur. Uh, pancreatoscopy guided lithotripsy allows for targeted stone therapy and stricter therapy can be performed at the same time. Additionally, stone clearance can be verified during pancreatoscopy. However, it's technically challenging and it's often limited by the patient's anatomy. And there is also a higher rate of adverse events. Uh, with this technique compared to ESWL. And now one of the major questions in the field is which is more effective for the treatment of pancreatic duct stones. And while I currently use both methods in conjunction for large stones, uh, we are currently performing a randomized study, including Guru's Coupe in Minnesota, uh, comparing the two techniques. Lastly, we'll briefly touch on pseudocyst. The 40% of patients with chronic pancreatitis uh, the question of when to drain them becomes important. And indications are typically signs of gastric outlet obstruction or signs of infection or signs of biliary obstruction. Um, EU has got a transmural drainage has really become the standard endoscopic approach and is performed, as Guru mentioned, with either double pigtail stents or a lumen opposing metal stents. And in terms of randomized trial data, there's been no difference between surgical cystgastrostomy and U.S. guided cystgastrostomy. And if we extrapolate from the data regarding walled off pancreatic necrosis, there's no difference between double pigtail stents and lumen opposing metal stents. And just want to highlight the two different techniques. This is a patient with chronic pancreatitis with pancreatic duct stones. Uh, she had a small pseudocyst here um, that was about three by four uh, centimeters in diameter. So we opted to go with the uh, double pigtail stent method. So we puncture first with a 19 gauge needle. And once we're in the collection, we start advancing our wire. And the goal is to coil the wire uh, multiple times. And once we do that, we're able to get a balloon dilator in. And we do serial dilations up to 10 millimeters in diameter. And then once you start deflating the balloon, you can see immediately that this brown fluid starts to come out, uh, which is the contents of the pseudocyst. And then with the wire in place, we're going to put our first double pigtail stent. And we typically like to put in two double pigtail stents, uh, typically seven French stents. Um, and so once we put our first one in, we recannulate the pseudocyst um, with the wire again, we coil it up. And then we're able to place our second double pigtail stent side by side, the first uh, double pigtail stent. 
as you can see here on the roster. And then I want to highlight the multiple gateway technique um, that Guru also uh, mentioned in his talk, but this is a patient with chronic pancreatitis who had one of those really, really large cirrhosis that was causing gastric outlet obstruction. Um, and so here you can see this is the EUS image. It's a really large collection. We're going to go in with aluminum posing metal stent. And in general, I've kind of been going more towards 20 millimeter aluminum posing metal stents over 15 millimeter stents. Uh, just because it facilitates kind of drainage and if you have to do an necrosectomy. So the first one's placed through the stomach, then we go from the duodenum, from actually closer to the third portion of the duodenum. So we kind of are targeting the inferior portion of the pseudocyst. So we put another 20 millimeter uh, axios, and you can see the big bulge that the um, pseudocyst is causing. Again, muddy contents come out as soon as we deploy that distal flange. We put our double pigtail stent coaxially through the aluminum posing metal stents. And in this patient, you can see the stents here. And we uh, took both uh, metal stents out after two weeks in the patient degree. Um, but with that, I want to say thank you uh, for tuning in. I'm certainly blessed to be here and we'll be able to work with such an excellent collegial group, which includes our division chair, Dr. George Papacristo, our medical pancreatologist headed by Phil Hart, our interventional pancreatologist headed by uh, Sam Krishna, and our translational researchers headed by Zobeda Cruz Monserrate. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Sam, for a great presentation here. Um, I have to say you make uh, pancreatic interventional work look very easy. Um, and so I have a couple of questions because Sometimes I think it's not so easy. So what do you, what, when, um, when you have stones in the pancreatic duct and you often, I don't know, find yourself that there's a stricture uh, more proximally. So how do you then counter, you know, big stone stricture between you and the stone um, in, in, in the management? Do you, do you just go to, go to Eswal? Do you try any salvage techniques? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. It's a big issue. Um, in general, I think our practice has been shifting more towards, so I started the SWL program here two years ago, but for any stones that are 10 millimeter or greater, we just start off directly with SWL just to get the stones fragmented enough. But it's still an issue because if they still have a stricture, those fragments aren't going to come out. And um, one of the major issues we found with SWL is that there are still a lot of radiolucent stones in the pancreatic duct that we only see on pancreatoscopy. We don't, obviously we don't see them on the pancreatogram during standard VRCP. So after SWAL, we will always actually still do an ERCP with pancreatoscopy to take a look. Um, obviously to get the pancreatoscope past the stricture, you need to be able to dilate it to, you know, at least 10 French, 10 and a half French really. Um, so you need to be able to do like a four millimeter balloon dilation uh, practically. So we will always try to dilate with a four millimeter balloon um, initially. If that doesn't work, one of the things that we found success is, and I think Guru mentioned this for his pancreatic gastrostomies, but we use the uh, cardiology um, dilation balloon, which is a very, very small caliber uh, catheter that I've been able to get through most strictures. Um, unfortunately, you do have to use a 0.018 inch guide wire. So that's kind of the smallest diameter wire. But if you're able to get that through, usually strictures in the head and neck you can treat. Unfortunately, the cardiology balloon is not long enough to treat body and tail strictures. But you just need to kind of get something past that stricture. So we'll dilate with that first and then kind of go on to bigger dilation balloons. But a lot of times there's just really tough strictures that are so concentric and just hard. And then, so our kind of second modality is to use the Sohendra stent retriever. Um, and then if that doesn't work, then I'll go to laser dissection uh, with Dulium, but that's definitely a much more kind of salvage option. Typically, at least for the first session, we want to try to at least get a five French stent in, if not something greater. And do you ever pursue, um, you know, stent placement prior to Eswal to help direct um, the Eswal? Yes, yeah, so I... I myself typically don't do that, but a lot of my partners uh, will start off with an ERCP and they'll put a stent in and they'll say, hey, there's a stone that the stent is leading up to. 
can you treat that with s -well? And actually, to be honest with you, it really does help with s -well because when you have a patient with chronic ulcerative pancreatitis on s -well, it's hard to know which ones are in the duct and which ones are in the stone. I mean, whichever ones are in the parenchyma. And so if you have a pancreatic duct stent and they tell you a specific, or you can look at their pancreatogram, but you can see which stone is causing the obstruction, then it makes it much easier. Um, so I do like it when there's a stent. It's just typically for me, I'm either going to start with s -wall, um, and then end with ERCP. I typically don't start with ERCP first in those situations. And is s -wall within your own uh, practice or do you have to rely on uh, outside uh, subspecialists to help you with this? Yes, I've been fortunate. I was actually trained by urologists to do s -wall. Um, So I do it myself. Um, so it's we do it at one of our outpatient surgery centers, and it's actually quite efficient. Um, the patients love it because, you know, parking is much easier at tertiary uh, kind of satellite sites. Um, but yeah, I do it myself. And then I've been training one of our medical pancreatologists, Mitch Ramsey. So he's going to start doing it as well. And then Peter Lee, who's one of the other interventional pancreatologists, he also does as well as well. Great. David, do you have any questions for Sam? I don't see any questions in the uh, chat. No, it was a great, great talk, Sam. Uh, one thing I did want to bring up that I had a question about actually uh, changing gears a little bit is that we frequently in the pediatric world are seeing a lot of patients showing up uh, recently with autoimmune pancreatitis and wanted to hear if you had you know, some experience in the adult world with that and how you approach that. If you have any endoscopic approach for it, obviously, if there's a biliary stricture, you, know, you may need to, to place a biliary stent. Uh, but you know, from a standpoint of an endoscopic ultrasound um, and some of the newer techniques and things, uh, have you guys started using any of those things? Have you seen this uh, with any frequency in adult patients? Yeah, no, that's a great question, David. And you know, fortunately for us, we have Phil Hart, who kind of owns all the autoimmune pancreatitis patients. And he's kind of the gatekeeper for us. So if he thinks that endoscopic therapy is warranted or if a biopsy is warranted, then he'll let us know and we'll do it. And I have to say, he does a great job with that because the patients that he asks us to biopsy, <laughs> most of the time when we biopsy on the US, it comes back as positive for AIP, uh, typically type one. Um, but in terms of the other kind of novel therapies for AIP, at least endoscopic, we haven't really been doing that in terms of diagnostic management. Um, we were really kind of relying on Phil's medical expertise in terms of his level of suspicions for AAP. And a lot of times, to be honest with you, Phil will just kind of empirically start treating them, even if he doesn't have histologic evidence of AAP, if the symptoms and the imaging make kind of sense. That's wonderful. Well, Sam and Guru, thank you uh, very much. Um, fantastic presentations, very informative, exciting uh, discussions. Um, and, and hopefully very educational for uh, certainly me and, and, and the rest of the attendees. And a uh, special thanks to um, CAPER uh, uh, organizers for allowing me and David uh, this opportunity to moderate this session. Uh, also for our attendees to attend uh, tonight's session. Uh, we look forward to next week's session on pancreatitis and uh, diagnosis of this, as well as pancreatic uh, ductal adenocarcinoma. So I hope everyone has a great evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank yeah, you, guys. Thanks, guys. Great, great talks. Thank you.